Or ever been faced with a task you didn't really want to do? Yeah. Well, I'm not alone. I think we all have that experience, right? And and this is this is for things that are that are bad we don't want to do. These are also for things that are that are good that we just don't want to do. Like I find my find myself, and here's just a, a confession. Um, so you can you get your paper out. Uh, when I was in seminary, I was a chaplain for about two years or so uh, at a at a like a pretty large hospital, uh, on call every weekend, uh, every other Tuesday, and. There were multiple times where I was called in to go meet with someone uh, that I did not want to go do. I can remember the feeling inside my heart going, I do not want to do this again. I don't want to go through the trauma. I don't want to go through uh, dealing with, I'm tired. I didn't sleep. I, I just don't want to deal with this. And, I, and just internally, I'm going, every, my body's just saying, stop, go back home, go back to bed. But my legs are going, okay, I have to go do this job. And I will say, every single time I went through and went through that whole process, um, the Lord always met me. And, and many times, I remember one specifically, I was so exhausted, I was so tired, I had just had my second child, Two, uh, my first two kids are 21 months apart, so that's two young kids, full-time seminary, doing full-time work, and I'm going to meet with someone whose uh, grandmother just passed away, and uh, I just didn't have it in me. And I walked in, and I met this family who was through tears praising the Lord, and through my inability, through, my, through the difficulty, through the opposition that was internal, the Lord met me and allowed me to walk away from that meeting and encounter refreshed. And I tell you that story uh, because I think all of us go through situations like this. I think all of us find ourselves called to certain tasks that the Lord has for us that we do not want to do. As simple as sharing the gospel with your neighbor, uh, to caring for and raising a child who just will not stop doing what they're doing, to serving underneath a boss that is less than generous or kind, or whatever it is. All of us have that experience because all of us live in a world that constantly opposes what God wants to do. But God gives us power, He gives us strength, and He works His plan through all of it. And today we're going to be looking at a story that explains and illustrates the reality of something that's very similar to what I just talked about. God calling his disciples, God sending his disciples, God working through his disciples in the face of opposition and persecution and difficulty. And what God does as his disciples follow him and as his disciples come back to him and how he provides for them. So if you have your Bibles with you, we are still in the book of Mark. Yes, chapter 6. If you haven't been here for a while, we've been walking through the book of Mark. If you're new with us, welcome. Uh, we are Bible Fellowship Church. We believe that this book right here it contains the inspired words of God. It is what He wanted written to us to tell us of who He is and what He's doing in this world. We believe that this, this book is not something to be worshipped, but it is something to be read understood and applied because it's something that helps us in our relationship with their, our creator. The one who made all things, the one who, who put everything into being, the one who has created everything, the one who's provided for the brokenness of this world, a solution for restoration. And so we, we typically will preach through books, we'll look at them, we'll read them, we'll understand them in their context, and we'll move through them so that we understand what God is trying to say to us. And so Mark is a, is a gospel, it's an account of Jesus' life, it's a, it's a gospel that is written to people in Rome, 
who are uh, suffering intense persecution, who are facing an intense rejection and, and death. Uh, friends and family members of people who have put their faith in Jesus are dead because of their faith in Jesus, and they're wondering, did I miss it? Am I following the right thing? Am I doing the right thing? Do I, is this Jesus, the true King and Savior that I need to follow? Is He worth laying my life down for? And so as we've been walking through Mark, we've been seeing that He is slowly and quickly at the same time showing us who is truly to be followed and valued in life. That Jesus is the true King. He is the one who has life. He is the one who is worthy to be followed. And so last week we looked at uh, uh, Jesus coming to the last time he would step into a synagogue and teach in his hometown where he grew up. This real person who was really born and really grew up in a town who really knew him and acted to him, for him, against him, like most people do when they know someone for a long time and they don't see something, they see them doing something that they don't expect. And this town rejected Jesus because he was a carpenter. He was a simple man. He didn't, he shouldn't know all this stuff. Who is this guy? He's the, uh, the child from a very questionable pregnancy of Mary. We know Jesus. Who is he to speak to us? And he couldn't do anything, any large miracle in that town because of their unbelief. In fact, they made him marvel at their unbelief. And in verse 6, it says this, and he marveled at their, because of their unbelief. And this says, and he went about among the villages teaching. So Jesus left his town who rejected him, kept on going around the villages around Nazareth and began to teach. And then this is what's going to happen. And I'm just going to warn you, I'm going to read right through this passage. We're going to go through a big chunk all the way to verse 30. And then I'm going to start working through the passage, highlighting a few points of what I believe the Lord is, is, is uh, saying to us here. And hopefully we'll have something to go home with um, and come back with uh, of what the Lord is doing and calling us to do in our life. So it says this, And he went about among the villages teaching, and he called the twelve, and he began to send them out two by two. And he gave them authority over the unclean spirits, and he charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff. No bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but wear sandals and not put on two tunics. And he said to them, Wherever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And if any place will not receive you, and they will not listen to you, when you leave, shake the dust off that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and they proclaimed and that the people should repent, and they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus, his name had become known. Some said, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work with him. But others said, he's Elijah. And others said, he is a prophet like the one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For it was Herod who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. Because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted him to be put to death. But she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, yet he heard him gladly. But an opportunity came when Herod on his birthday gave a banquet for his nobles and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. For when Herodias' daughter came and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it to you. And he vowed to her, to her whatever you ask, I will give to you up to half of my kingdom. 
And she went out and said to her mother, For what should I ask? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. And she came and immediately with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry because of his oaths and his guests. He did not want to break his word to her. And immediately the king sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. And he went and beheaded him in the prison. And he brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. And the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest for a while. For many were coming and going and they had no leisure even to eat. So this is a, a large story and a lot is going on in here. And if you'll notice, Mark is doing what he's done already twice in his gospel. He sandwiches a story in the middle of another story. So he starts the story out with sending out the disciples, sending, sending them out. First time they're called apostles, the sent ones, to go out and proclaim his message to their surrounding areas. And then while that's going on, he tells and flashes back to a story about John the Baptist and Herod and Herodias and everything that happened with that. And then after that flashback, he comes back and concludes the story of the disciples going out and coming to him. And this is intentional for Mark. This is on purpose. This is here to illustrate to the reader the dangers of what these disciples and those who come and follow after Jesus and are sent by Jesus face. You see, Jesus sends and empowers his disciples with urgent mission that faces opposition. He sends in his disciples, he empowers them, and he, but he, that, that mission faces opposition. Right? What happened right before this story? Jesus was rejected. He was rejected in his town. Nobody would listen to him. And what happened before that? He raised a young girl from the dead. Like, if you're just reading this, this is incredible irony. Son of God just raised a woman from the dead. And he goes to his town and he's rejected. And after he's rejected... He sends his disciples to go do the work that he has been doing. Now, if you've been reading along with us for any uh, time, any few weeks here, you'd notice that these disciples are messing it up left and right. right? They're actually the picture of what you should not be as a disciple. They're the ones who are who are confused and don't understand what, what, who he is or what's going on, even though he's giving them insider information. They're the ones who are terrified, even though they should have faith. And the unnamed woman who is bleeding and has all sorts of issues is the one who is shown as the faithful disciple who trusts Jesus and comes behind him while the disciples are sitting like the crowd, questioning and jarring and joking at Jesus. Like, who do you think, who touched you? Who touched you? What are you talking about, Jesus? These disciples are the ones who are placed in the place of unbelief, of, uh, of questioning, of doubting, and incompetence. Yeah, Jesus says, all right, guys, come on, it's time for you to go. He goes around, he's teaching, he's training, and he sends these disciples out unqualified for the work that they're about to do. He gives them authority to cast out demons and heal people. He gives them a commissioning. He tells them to go. 
And he gives them some really strange instructions. Bring a staff, the clothes on your back, don't carry an extra one, no bread, no food, no money. And I mean, this is the ancient Near East where you had to walk everywhere. You know, I know, I know that, uh, you know, there's a joke that there's a car in the Bible because the disciples walked in one accord, um, but there were no motor vehicles. Um, yeah, it's a bad dad joke, and I get to say that because I'm a dad. Um, but there were no motor vehicles at this time. People walked everywhere. There were no credit cards. There were no convenience stores. There were no grocery stores. There was just dependence on the absolute provision of God for anyone who was walking, even if they had provisions with them. And Jesus tells them to do something very peculiar and go with a staff, go with nothing else, go relying on your heavenly Father to provide for you what you need for the task that He sets you out on. Which is very reminiscent of what God asked Israel to do in Exodus chapter 14. Quickly eat, go with your staff in hand, don't take anything extra, run out because the Lord is taking you out of here. And he sends them out. And go, if you, the person who received you, go sit there, go stay there, don't look for a better place, don't look for something that's nicer, just go where you're at and trust in the Lord's provision and be grateful. But also understand that you're going to go to places that people are going to reject you. They're not going to want to hear your message. They're not want, going to want to talk to you. They're going to do what they've done to me, like my own hometown and my own people. And when you go there and you face that opposition, just leave. It's okay. I'm empowering you to walk away. You are not responsible to save anyone, you're not responsible to make anyone repent, you're not responsible to cause anyone to do anything that they don't want to do. You're responsible to carry a message and not carry an offense when someone rejects it. So shake the dust off your feet. Now all of these things that the Lord is doing and asking of these people describes something about the nature of the mission that the Lord is sending them on. One, it is a nature of dependence. These disciples need to depend on the Lord for everything. Their food, their safety, their sleep. Even the effectiveness of what they're called to do. They have to depend on him. It's no different than what he's asking of us. Every single one of us in here who have put their faith in Jesus has been given a mission by God to carry his message to this world. They went out, go, they went out going and proclaiming people and asking them to repent. Why? Why? Because they needed to. They needed to change their mind about the way they've been thinking and the way they've been living. They needed to change their mind about life and who is in charge. Repentance. Metanoia. It's, it just means to change my mind. That affects an action, but it first starts with the way I think about things. And the way we are born to think about things is wrong. We are born to think life is about me. We are born to think that it is all about my decisions and what I want and me getting mine and me doing the way I want to do things or the way I think it should be done. And God says, no, life is about me. Life is about my way. Life is about living for the one who created you, who knows your needs. Who knows how difficult life is? 
and can still provide. Life is about trusting me to provide. And you'll get there when you understand that you are broken and you need help. So the disciples going out and proclaiming and preaching and asking people to repent and receive the message of the coming king is a call that is on all of our responsibilities. And they go out, they do it, they go, and then Mark enters in this disjunctive story to put attention to what can happen to those who follow Jesus, but even more to put a contrast between the goodness of the king who brings life and the reality of all the worldly kings who ultimately bring death in life. See, Jesus... The true king seeks to give and restore life while those who claim worldly power seek to destroy it. Jesus, the true king, seeks to give and restore life and that's what the disciples are going to proclaim. This book started with John the Baptist. It began with him calling for people to repent For the kingdom of God is near. It started aligning John the Baptist with Elijah, the one who is there to prepare the way for the Lord. And he sees Jesus, he baptized Jesus, Jesus goes out into the wilderness, he comes back after John is arrested, and then Jesus begins to proclaim for people to repent because the kingdom of God is at hand. And the disciples are doing the same thing John the Baptist did, the same thing that Jesus is asking them to do. And here's one quick note. Jesus doesn't ask the disciples to do anything that he's not willing to do himself. He does all of this th- these things himself, and then he instructs them to go. Really, it's the same thing in leadership, same thing in discipleship. You should not follow someone who is not willing to do what they're asking you to do. You should not follow a leader in the church if they're not willing to follow through with what they're asking you to do. I cannot come up here and preach and proclaim for us to do something that I'm not willing to apply for myself. Even if it's difficult and I'm having trouble. John the Baptist preached... Jesus preached, the disciples preached, and we go to John the Baptist, and what we see is Herod. Now, who's Herod? He's the son of Herod the Great, Herod Antipas. When Herod the Great died, his territory was split up by Emperor Augustus, four different districts. His two sons are in the north. Herod's over, uh, over Galilee. Philip, his brother, is up over the Decapolis. And Herod wanted to be a king. So he actually asked Augustus, if you would give me the title of king of Galilee. You know what Augustus told him? No. You will be a governor. That's why Mark and and Luke both call him the Tetrarch. He's a governor of Galilee. Why does Mark call him a king here? Mark's the only one who calls him a king. Mark is trying to help us see this point. This point. This man who wants to be a king is claiming himself as a king, is putting himself in the place of being a king and seeking after worldly power, is revealing something that is in the nature of everyone who seeks after that kind of power. So he's a... He's a wannabe king. He wants to be a king. He's not true king, but he wants to be. Like every king on this earth. And he's vying for a position. He's vying for power. He's doing things the wrong way. He marries Philip's wife. This is an incestuous relationship. Clearly condemned by the Old Testament and Leviticus. 
You shall not, Leviticus 18, 18, 16, you shall not uncover the nakedness of your brother's wife. It is your brother's nakedness. 21, 2021, if a man takes his brother's wife, it is impurity. He has uncovered his brother's nakedness. They shall be childless. Like, it can't be any clearer than that. This is wrong. And John is calling it out. Herod, you're wrong. And Herodias, his wife, who apparently is trying to climb the same social ladder, gets angry at it. And she wants him dead. Which is kind of similar to what most people want when someone calls out their sin. I don't want to deal with my sin. I want the person who's pointing it out to go away. And so John puts him in prison. But he doesn't want to kill him because there's some good left in the man. He's listening to him. I mean, the text is very interesting. Uh, he, verse 20, he feared John, knowing that he was righteous. Herod's like, I know I'm not righteous. I know you are righteous. I don't want to do anything wrong there, but I got this wife. She's telling me what to do, and I got I to gotta keep the peace in the household. Happy wife, happy life. So I want to listen to you, John. I'm, I'm really perplexed by what you say. This is really interesting, but you've got to stay in prison. I'm sorry. And this man who th- he throws a party, he brings his friends. All this stuff happens. Most of us know this story, but if you don't, Herodias sends her daughter, probably not Herod's daughter, but sends her daughter to dance, most likely erotically, in front of these people. And it gains such a following in favor of Herod who is showcasing the same type of disposition that he did in marrying his brother's wife towards his his wife's daughter. I'll give you anything, even up to half of my kingdom, which is not his to give, right? He can't give his kingdom away. He doesn't have that authority. He can't give to this person what she's asking for. And she goes to her mom, and her mom says, I want him dead. Which is eerily similar. Similar? 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 That's the word. To the story of Ahab and Jezebel, and Elijah and the prophets of Baal. You guys know this story? Elijah, this major prophet, this story exists about Jezebel from 1 Kings chapter 16 all the way through 2 Kings chapter 9. It's a big chunk in the history of Israel. And you have a prophet who opposes what they're doing, and you have a woman who is married to a king who wants this person dead. Jezebel doesn't get it. But Herodias does. And Herod doesn't even want to kill him. He's sad about it. But he's so caught up in the web of power that he's sitting in that he cannot say no to what he's already promised in front of his friends and other politically powerful people and his wife. So he cannot do the right thing because he's caught up within the worldly power structure which results in the death of a person. Now this story about this daughter who was doing something and then asking for something contrasts with what had just happened in Mark about a story about another daughter who is not named but has a named father. Jairus. A man of political influence. A man of means, Herod, a man of political influence, a man of means, Jairus, daughter is sick and he needs his Jesus to come and heal her. Herod, daughter is sick mentally and he takes the life of a prophet. Jairus' daughter is raised to life and Jesus asks to give him food. Herod's daughter kills a man, and brings his head on a platter. These are there clearly to be extremely clear. 
as to who is the right king to follow. Jesus gives life. He restores life. He's not there to take away from you. He's not there to destroy you. Yes, some of the things he says are offensive because they, they cause us to deal with the reality of the sin in our life. But they're not there to destroy you. He's there to rescue you. Worldly kings, worldly powers are there offering things to you, position, wealth, ease, comfort, and all of it is just going to steal from you the very thing that you're trying to preserve. Jesus is the true king that we should follow. So these disciples, in the middle of this story, and this is happening, they're out there proclaiming. They're out there preaching. They're out there risking their lives dependent on God for their provision, for their food, for their shelter. Facing rejection, facing opposition, all the while, the one who came before them doing the very thing that they did is just killed. That's a difficult place to be in. Yet they're called to carry out the mission in the face of it. See, the disciples are called to carry out the mission even though the one who came before them lost his life because of it. Now, I can just imagine what the disciples are thinking of when they hear about what happened to John and the tension that's going on in the world around them of what Jesus is doing, which is not what they were hoping. This king who would come, who would rescue, who would free them from Rome, who would give them safety and their land back, is causing his own people to reject him and fight against him and plan against him and kill those who are following him. I know what it does for the the people that he wrote it to, who are in Rome under Nero, who is actively killing those who have proclaimed Jesus as their Savior, who has followed Jesus, who has spoken, who has been a disciple on mission, preaching and proclaiming the gospel, and were rounded up like dogs and put into a coliseum. It tells them, don't give up. Don't give in to the fear. Don't give in to what your body is telling you not to do because it is worth it. The king you're serving is giving life. The king you're serving loves you. The king you're serving will provide for you. And even if you die, you will, you will yet live. Helps us understand what Justin Martyr famously said. The more often you mow us down, the more often we rise. The blood of Christians is seed. There's a mentality that has been taken up by those who claim the name of Christ. That his mission rises up above all things. What he calls me to, I obey. Where he leads me, I go. Because he's good, he's faithful, and he's the one who's worthy to be followed. Soren Kierkegaard, and I quoted him last week, he says this, The tyrant dies and his rule ends. The martyr dies and the rule begins. Jesus sending out the disciples, Mark recording this account, is there, all there to encourage believers to be confident in their mission, to rest in the Father, to trust in His provision. And the disciples come back from this, their whole excursion, after this whole description of what happened with John, 
Verse 30, the apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, come away by yourself to a desolate place and rest for a while. See, though the mission is difficult, Jesus cares for his disciples with provision and rest. What does that short statement tell me? One, though they walked with nothing but the clothes on their back and a staff in their hand, they came back and did not die. Did not suffer lack. They did not suffer want. The Lord fulfilled his purpose for them. He did everything that he was calling them to do, even though they did not have all the resources that they thought they needed. And this is walking. This is day, I don't know how long their trip was and their journey was, but this is a while. And they come back to Jesus fulfilled with what he has sent them out to do. And what does he tell them to do? Come and rest. Come and stop. You're exhausted. You've been on a long journey. You've had a tough mission. It is okay to rest. What does that tell us about Jesus? He's not there to use us up. He's not there to use us up. And a lot of people say, and I think it's in good intentions, Lord, use me. And I think that's a good thing because I want to be useful for the king and his kingdom. But he doesn't use people like things to be discarded. He empowers them, he works through them, and he provides for them what they need. He's not an overbearing and demanding king. He knows we're exhausted, and he knows that we don't need to do it all. Oftentimes when you're on the Lord's mission, you're doing what he's called you to do, you can get exhausted. And Jesus says, it's okay. Come, receive from me, rest. Stop. Take a moment. Get quiet. Rest. My way is not the world's way. What you're pursuing in the world will lead you completely out of rest and completely unfulfilled. What I'm calling you to do will be hard and difficult, but I will fulfill you and I will give you rest. And all of this leads to and helps us understand and look forward to what happens when we finally finish our mission here. We sang about it earlier coming and entering into his rest, blessed assurance. He's going to bring me to himself. Now, one clear thing that I didn't mention that we should understand when we read this is the foreshadowing of what will happen to Jesus, who was given into the hands of another king who doesn't want to kill him, but his people call for his death, who will be taken and put into a tomb, by his disciples and will ultimately rise from the dead in that tomb. But while that foreshadows that, this passage calls us and asks us the question of whether or not we're going to be on the mission that he sends us on. My simple question for you today, and maybe it's simple, maybe it's difficult, I don't know, is am I living on mission? We say this all the time here, uh, and hopefully we don't ever stop, but ministry is not a single player game. It is a team sport. It is not something that is there for the select few who are privileged to pay paid to be good. It is for the good for nothings, too. It is something that every single believer is privileged to walk in. No matter how qualified you think you need to be, 
It is something that's not meant to be on your own. Right? Notice how Jesus sent them two by two. He didn't say, Peter, you get full of energy. You go off by yourself, do your thing. Uh, the rest of you guys go over here. No, he sent them with someone to be with them. But it's for all of those who follow after him. Right? Even before he sent the disciples out on their mission, he sent a person who was a Gentile who was filled with a legion of demons to go proclaim his message to his hometown. The same mission. Go tell him what the Lord has done for you. Go tell of, of his mercy in your life. Go tell of them what he's done in your life. I mean, he didn't train him to sit him through seminary. He didn't tell him, teach him the Bible stories and, and make him memorize a bunch of verse. He just says, go tell what Jesus has done in your life. That means nobody needs to be qualified to proclaim the message of Jesus other than those who have come to Jesus and experienced his salvation in their life. And if I can just share my story of how I was addicted to drugs or pornography or affairs or whatever it is, and Jesus rescued me, nobody can steal that from you. Nobody can deny the reality of God's work in your life. And God can use it to bring others to Him. Each of us has this choice every day. Just like you have the choice to sit in a long sermon. You could have gotten up and leave, left. Each of us has been called to a mission. God's mission. Proclaiming His grace and mercy and forgiveness that is found in Jesus. Each of us is called to be with Jesus and be sent by Jesus. Each of us is called to be provided for by Jesus in dependence on Jesus. Each of us is called to take our weakness and our disadvantage and put it in the hands of God so He does something great. Each of us is called to go to people who will receive us and stay with them. Go to the place the Lord led you and stay there until the Lord leads you somewhere else. Don't have an eye for greener pastures. Be faithful and bloom where you're planted. All of us are called not to carry the offenses of those who who come against what God is doing. If they reject you, leave. Shake the dust off your feet as a sign against them. It's a sign, but it's also a sign to us. Don't carry a speck of the offense that they have given. Let the Lord alone judge them. All of us are called to find our rest in Jesus through it all. So, am I living on mission? Up for you to decide. Lord Jesus, we thank you. We love you. We praise you. You are great. You are merciful. You are kind. You are worthy of our unending praise. Lord, you know our weakness. You know our inability to follow through with what you've called us to do. And Lord, we thank you that even though we are faithful, lists at times you remain faithful we thank you that you don't shame us lord but that you correct us we thank you that you don't sit and shake your finger at how bad we've been doing but lord you're constantly calling us to receive from you forgiveness empowerment you want to utilize us in this world for our good for your glory. Lord, we ask that you would give us a renewal, that you renew us in our inner man, that you would give us a passion for your name, that Isaiah 26, 8 would be our, uh, our statement and life song for your name and your renown of the desires of our souls. We trust you, praise you, your name. Amen.